Hey guys, today I'm going to show you how to transform your nasty old closet into something functional and beautiful like this. So first thing you need to know about these doors is there's two components to it. There's the bracket on the top, okay, and there's a screw here that adjusts the height of the door and the bracket has a wheel that sits in the track. So let me just show you this. You can put a drill in reverse, it's a Phillips screw, go backwards to lower the door, okay, and you go forward to raise the door. That's all you need to know. If your doors are grinding and they're not moving or they're twisted, you can adjust these two brackets to lift them up off the bottom track and get them working again. Now let's take a look at the bottom. Down here you have a plastic slide, okay? And underneath here, I'll just pop this up, this little pin right here sits inside the groove, okay? And it should have lots of freedom of movement, okay? And when we put them in and we're installing a door, we'll just set it in the right spot and then we'll just give it a shot with a screwdriver. And then when I'm up here adjusting the door, the pin on the bottom is secured in the track and it doesn't move because it has range of motion. So that's really the simplicity of the whole system. So if you want to remove them and put new ones in, you can, or you can remove them, tape them down and paint the trims and you have a brand new mirror door. If you're on a budget, this is a great way to do it. So what we do, we lift it all the way to the bottom. Okay, there we go. And then I'm gonna go up just a touch. And here's why. Do the same thing over here. We'll go all the way to the bottom. There, and lift it just a touch. I'm gonna to take my screwdriver, and I'm gonna pop the two pins out. Now the door swings freely from the track. And now what we do is we're gonna lift it forward and lift the wheel up out of the track. Because we brought the, the, the bracket all the way down, left, left lots of room, it pops off that easily. And then we can set it aside. All right, here we go. Okay. Ah, now the second door is the same as the first. Let's pull it forward. A couple of steps, and there we go. So the first thing I'm gonna do now is remove the top track, because we are gonna wanna paint that to reuse it. It's amazing how many things, as a society, we throw away that are perfectly good. I just need a paint job. And at a time where everybody's interested in saving a few bucks, learning how to do things yourself is the key to success. Okay, I think that's it for screws. There we go. So what we want to do is we want to take this away. We want to paint the front of this, and maybe even the inside a little bit, right? Make it look all brand new and white. We'll set that aside. That's all reusable. Before I go any further though, I want to get this track off the ground. Let's take a look at this. And I think we have an opportunity to learn something here. That was installed incorrectly. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel better. My plan is actually to come back and put 5H hardwood in this room. And so to reinstall the door, I need to at least have, you know, three quarter of a gap between the door and that trim, and I had it. And so now that I know that this was installed incorrectly, I have even more room. So that's the original carpet in this house, 1974. Pretty. Nasty shag. All right, so this is all garbage. This is the new carpet and the new under pad. Okay, just to give you an idea. We're gonna get rid of all that change all this out to hardwood. And once we have hardwood, we're kind of raising our expectations for the room. We wanna make this look like a house, right? So we're gonna bring the hardwood all the way through, lay our new track on there. And of course, everything here is gonna get painted. And you don't wanna open up a door with everything all looking brand new and modern to something like this. So we're gonna get rid of this shelf and this rod. We're gonna maintain the shelving over there, but my job, so I'm gonna build a tower up the middle here, shoes and sweaters and that sort of stuff. And then we'll have one shelf coming across the top, a full length garment rod here. And over here, we're gonna have two rods, one high and one in the middle. That's for all your separates. That's so if a guy does end up living here, he's got somewhere to put his shirt and pants and he'll get this much space. As for the shelf and rod, let's get rid of the rod first, shall we? Yeah, that's screwed into drywall. <laughs> ah. That amazes me. Right? Like, let's face it, builders know 
said there's going to be a rod there. It's 12 inches off the corner. There should be framing there. That's fine. There isn't. We'll just... Just a cheap plastic rod anyway, right? That's why there's so many supports. Because this is just a cheap piece of tin with a plastic cap wrapped around it. That's the kind of junk you get in a bathroom in the shower in the 70s. They use the same junk here. Remember, building code requires a rod in the shelf. So the cheapest crap they can put in is what you're going to get. Uh, wait a second. I'm having a hard time getting at that screw. Now, if you're having a hard time making that connection and drilling properly, you just need to get a longer bit. That'll always work. Because it keeps the chuck away from all the metal. That's why I own that bit. People are asking me all the time, where do you get it from? Anywhere where they sell um, recyclable blades, right? In Canada, Home Hardware sells them. Uh, Rona sells them. Down in the States, I have no idea. I haven't gone shopping for them yet. I used to be able to get them at Home Depot. I don't just have this bit because it's cool. I have it because it's really practical in doing installations like this. That's one piece of wood, eh? Okay, there we go. Scratch one shelf. Or is it two shelves held together with a plastic trim? Oh my. That's quality. Here we go, folks. Particle board shelf and a plastic U channel. And yes, you can still buy that today if that's your fancy. We are going to upgrade from there. <laughs> Here's a little fancy fact. These brackets are screwed right into wood. And they're even on an angle here, I can tell. That's a four foot panel. It looks like every 16 inch spacing, doesn't it? One, two, three. Yeah. That'd be pretty amazing if this house was actually framed 16 on center. Which would make some sense because along this side is actually carries the load. Maybe they did. That'd be awesome if I actually was in a trailer. Sorry, mobile home. That was 16 inch on center on the exterior wall. Two by four. Because I've heard horror stories about 24 inch center, two by three. If you got a mobile home, I'm curious how old your house is. And if you know what your construction style is, put it in the comments below and where you bought it. I'd love to know what kind of different construction they're selling out there. Because I get questions all the time from folks from different parts of the world with different scenarios. And the more information I have about what people can expect as far as their construction is concerned, the better I can help people in our members form. And if you haven't joined our membership yet, consider it. If you're gonna do a major project, join the membership. Okay, it's just five bucks a month. And you get access to our live shows and you can ask questions and you can send us pictures and then we can help respond to you about you know, troubleshooting and that sort of thing. Uh, I think we're pretty much ready for paint in here now. Yeah, that is nasty, eh? Wow. Okay, we're just going to rip out the carpet. So that's today's project to finish clearing out the carpet and readjust this header so that I am ready to move forward with painting and then building the closet once I get the flooring in. The program here today is simple. We are in a double wide trailer. So I've got paneling and trims. And because I'm upgrading all this place to look like a house, all of my casing and jam extensions and all that stuff everywhere, it's all getting thrown out. I'm putting in brand new casings and baseboard. So that makes my process here pretty simple. The goal today is open this up, expose the framing, and hopefully we're gonna find a two by three underneath here as a plate that I can remove and replace with a one by three, and that'll buy me the extra inch that I need so that I've got enough room to put in my subfloor and reuse these doors. So, uh, without further ado, let's get busy. So I've got this jam extension right here. Okay, this is gonna go. It's about the same thickness as what I'm gonna put back, so I'm not gaining any space by removing this. All right, and this is what I'm looking for. Now, what we have to do is pry this paneling off and find out if we're in luck. Fingers crossed. Nope. <laughs> it is already a one by three. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. I mean, 
I can see it. I don't know if anybody else in the world can. I want everybody at home to be able to see what I'm up to, but we're just gonna pull this down. There we go. Okay, okay. See, I thought I was gonna be all creative and use a one by three to solve this problem. They're already using a one by three, which means all I've gotta do is cut the entire header to the new height that I want and then install a new one by three because I'm not gonna be able to reuse all that. That's crazy. All right, so what I'm gonna do is set a new mark. I just clean this up and then add a one by three wide enough to be my jam extension. Oh, okay, well that's a little bit easier. On the back side, I'm gonna take off this quarter inch vinyl. What you're gonna find in life is every time you wanna be budget conscious and be cheap and save some money, you're gonna spend a lot of extra time to do it. And that is just no way to get around that. Here we go. Now because I'm gonna be finishing everything off with modern looking casing, I have a lot of extra mercy here. So I can cut back more material than I need to knowing it's going to be covered and I don't have to be exact here. So what we're going to do here is set the blade depth so it's not too ridiculous. There we go. Now all I need my safety glasses now. I have no idea where my interior safety glasses are. I barely use them. So these are going to have to do. Now the secret here is because I know where I'm cutting right off the edge of this mark here. So this here is when you're cutting 45, that's the notch. That's where you see the blade. And this is the regular one. This groove right here, that's your cutting line, okay? Fair piece of wood here. I'm gonna go a little bit higher than I need to, again, because I'm gonna finish wide with my one by four. If you're staring at your blade, everything that's bouncing around in here is coming right at your face. So protect yourself, stay away from the blade, and stare here, and that's where you gotta look. Look where you're going, not where you've been, okay? That's the safest way to use a tool. So what I gotta do now is peel off the trims, pull all the extra nails off, prep this area, reinstate the trim, reinstate this to the, the wood, and then go shopping for a new one by four. Now, once I put the new one by four on, I'll have it come out to the, the face of this and cover on the inside, so that my casing will go on it and I'll have gained that extra half an inch that I'm losing by putting down subfloor. We're back in business. So the key here is, I'm adding half inch subfloor, I removed the extra half inch MDF, MDF paper wrap, and by reinstating a one by three, that's actually one by four, and making it wide enough to cap it all, I don't need the second piece with all the trims. Next step is to pull this carpet. This looks like they used uh, spray glue just to tack down the underpad. It doesn't hardly bond anything to anything, but it kept it in place while they were doing the install. Okay. It looks like when they changed the carpet, they changed this tack strip, put a new piece in, but left all the old ones there. Hopefully, they come off without too much of a fight. <laughs> What I'm doing is I'm just using my claw flat on the ground and coming straight to the head of the nail where I know it's attached. And it's just creating a wedge. It does most of the work for you. Just getting there. And then they come out in one piece. That's so much easier to manage. Unfortunately, I can't do that on around the edge. Oh, wow. Let me tell you something. Oh. This stuff from the 1970s is a lot stronger than that recent one. I'll tell you that right now. Look at that. It's not even taking the nails out. 
Oh, great. I'm gonna have nothing but nails breaking through. These tack strips are more like a luon, like a, instead of a piece of wood, they're like a piece of plywood. You see, the nails are all breaking off instead of coming out. Look at this. Well, there's two ways to deal with nails. One is to take them out. One is to drive them in. <laughs> well, once I get all of this removed and all the trim's gone, um, we'll put in that new one by three. Then we're gonna prime this place up. All right, guys, so now we got the hole resized for the closet and we're gonna be priming soon. But before we get into all that, let's just take a minute and fix up these doors. So I want you to have faith that you can restore these things. This is the 3M hand masker, all right? We just stretch it out. We're gonna just tape and drape over my existing. I tape along the perimeter just to set up a really nice edge for myself. You wanna get a really nice sharp knife here. This comes as a six foot plastic cover. And the reason we wanna go dramatic like this is just because when you're using an airless sprayer, it has a pretty defined line and you can use a spray shield or something, but we're using a spray can and it has a really broad spray pattern. It's oil based, it doesn't dry in the air on the way to the product. So we gotta make sure that we get this where we want it and that we tape it off. This will ensure that we don't have to clean the glass after the fact. And when we get down to the bottom, if we're a little short on the plastic, we're just gonna run a couple of runs of tape here to cover the glass. That is masking quick and easy. Now, just as a side note, I'll tell you something right now. If you have, it's totally unrelated to this project, but if you have a wooden window and you wanted to paint the wood and you got the wooden frames on the inside, there is a product on the market at the professional paint stores. And what it is, it's a product that you apply to the whole window, okay? The wood and the glass. And this particular product, you apply to everything. And what it does, it seals and primes the wood and it creates a film on the glass. So then you can go along and spray all of your wood only. Take a knife and you cut the inside of the paint and peel that film off that comes with the paint. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a video on that because it's a miracle worker. You're stuck dealing with old wooden windows you're trying to restore. But I just saw that in the store the other day. It reminded me, man, it's been a while since I used it. But somebody out there is gonna appreciate the tip. Um, if you're not sure where to find it, you can definitely pick it up at Sherwin-Williams. Pop by, ask the manager and say, hey, where is that spray-on primer for wood that can be peeled off the glass after the fact? Now, I have a little bit of tape on my metal. Let's get that out of my way. Here we go. High-performance enamel. Shake it. Ah, really good. Don't worry about the wall behind me. We're gonna be doing all kinds of wonderful things to it. Now, nice and quick. Just got a bit of a base coat on there. Okay, until this paint starts to come out. There we go, now we'll slow down. Get a nice, get a nice coat from a couple of different angles. The secret to this paint is don't press the button until your can is moving, all right? And don't put too much product on there that it starts to drip. This actually does dry up in about 15 minutes. So you have the luxury of coming back for another coat if you find the color of the metal behind is still poking through. There we go. So, a few bucks in tape and plastic, not even half a can of spray paint, Here's a $20 project. That'll save you almost $100 a door. All right. Let's let that sit for a few minutes and then we'll hit it again. We'll do the other door. Then we're gonna put them away in storage in another part of the house because the next step in this room is actually to put the subflooring down and then we can get this place primed. Okay guys, welcome to the cutting room. I gotta set up a cutting station in this environment because honestly, uh, we're going to be cutting particle board and you don't want to be in the same room as particle board when you're cutting it Because uh, the installation like I don't mind coming out here and make a mess and then go and do all the assembly in a nice clean environment But if I'm in that mess all day long, then I've got to get masks on and you know My camera guy's got to wear masks all day long and we're just gonna do some cutting real quick We're gonna make the boxes. We're gonna cut our French cleat and then we're gonna go and do the installation in the other room where it's nice and clean 
And that is why I'm not wearing a mask today. Hopefully you can all accept that. The French cleat is really simple. What we're gonna do here, just to be able to put this together, is I'm gonna screw this down and then I'm gonna rip it by freehand, okay? So let me just get a couple screws and the drill. I'm gonna be basically just screwing in one inch of this material into the two by six. Yeah, piece of cake. Now, in order to do a rip for a French cleat, we have to change the angle on the saw. We're gonna to go to 45 degrees, okay? You also wanna double check now off the, off the plate. Is that deep enough to cut through the material? And it looks like it's sitting at about an inch, but I'm gonna give myself a little more space just to be clear, sure on that. This plate is right here. This notch is when I'm cutting material when the blade is square off. When I'm cutting on a 45, this notch right here is where the blade is gonna be penetrating the material. And it's three quarter inch thick, and so it'll be coming out on the bottom side three quarter inches this way. So I wanna make sure that I leave enough material here. I got about an inch on the other side. That gives me something I can screw to from both pieces when I'm building my, my, my closets. And here we go. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be holding my, the tip of my finger right here, way far away from the blade, don't get worried and I'm gonna just run it right down the middle. Now the reason you don't have to be exact and use a table saw on this is because the, they mirror each other, okay? So even if the cut is wobbly, the same piece of the bottom will line up with the same piece on the top on the, on the cabinet side. So we're not gonna worry about that. Now here we go. Three quarters I said, right? Two and one inch, there, boom. Now, the secret here is I know I'm gonna be cutting this in a few different places. What I wanna do is I wanna just put um, A on the wood. That one's gonna be about 40 inches, the first cabinet. And so then the second cabinet is from here. This will be B. And then this will be C. Okay? So I know how this all works. I'm not gonna get lost in translation somewhere along the way. Now, this one gets mounted right on the wall. Okay, so this is the wall surface, and then there's an angle. And so then the next piece will sit down in it, and that'll carry the weight, and it'll pull it nice and tight towards the wall. That's as simple as that, okay? I'm gonna set this aside to cut my cleats into the finished box. Um, I can use my chop saw to cut the, this piece and make it perfect, so that's probably gonna need precision. Building the boxes, I'm doing freehand because I don't have all the tools. And uh, I'm not in the mood to buy any today. I just wanted to make this quick, simple cabinet system for you guys. Here's my design, all right? Uh, I wrote this out on a, basically a napkin, right? It's not that tricky. Let's get uh, box number one built now. It's going to be a 40 inch tall by 40 box. The concept of the design is simple. I'm making a box, it's a square with a piece of French cleat on it and a shelf in the very bottom. And I'm gonna put a hanging rod two locations, okay? And we're gonna be mounting this um, high enough up on the wall, uh, closer to um, uh, closer to seven feet on the ceiling, okay? So that we have 36 inches of space, and then 36 inches of space, and then there's still room before the floor. Okay, makes sense? So we wanna go to seven feet, almost seven feet on the wall. This way you can get two, twice as much closet space on a wall. That's all, piece of cake. Now, I am looking to get uh, something cut exactly 40 inches, and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be using the two by fours here, just to keep my saw from cutting my desk. All right, here's my material. And I'm, I'm going big too, because my closet is so deep, I'm actually going big. You don't have to, you can go and get the 12 inch material. I actually was uh, looking to do some 12 inch shelving in there as well, but <sighs> at last there is no 12 inch melamine in the market right now. It's amazing when there's a supply chain shortage, the decisions that are made at head office. And the decision is, well, 
If we don't have the ability to make all of the stuff we need, let's make the most expensive one and let them cut it down. Let's let them spend more money than they need to get the material they want and throw a bunch of stuff in the garbage. But at least we get paid, right? What a great way to mark up a one, <laughs> one by 12. And that is to make them all one by 16. For me, I'm lucky because I can put in 16 inch shelving in my closet, I don't care. But for a lot of other people, that's gonna be maddening. Now, we want a 40 inch piece. Let's first of all, mark 40 inches. This is as simple as it gets, guys. 40 inch tall is right there, okay? And I'm gonna do that over here as well. And always mark exactly where you want it. Take a triangle, buy a big one, okay? This is the DeWalt, it's 12 inch. Um, they don't, I mean, I could have a 16 or a 24, but I don't, so I have to cut this twice, and that's fine. Hey, uh, we're gonna put this right near the cut so that I can hold this steady while I'm cutting. I like that, okay. Now, key. We want this to be thick enough to cut the material only, okay? There we go. About an inch and a quarter is plenty. It's a three quarter inch material. Mm. Set the blade and then plug it in. Don't do what I do. <laughs> now, just to be clear, the edge of that material is zero. I put a black marker line on it because that's the thickness of my blade. So if I want exactly 40 and I'm cutting on the finished side, I can't put the edge of the saw there or I'm going to get 39 and 7 8. I have to put the, that there because I want that pencil mark to be just barely visible so I have a 40 inch piece. So what I do is I put my saw where I want it so when I'm done cutting the material away I have the right measurement. The other way to do it would be to measure from the left side which would be simpler and then I can put that right on that mark. But I'm making it painful today. Here we go. Now I'm going to Squeeze this in place. This is my guard. Okay, I'm going to be running this part of the plate up against that. And that's all you got to do to make a straight line. Remember, we don't start cutting until up here. So we're going to line up for the blade depth. I'm liking that. I'm squeezing it. I'm going to turn this on and get it going. Well, that was disappointing. Is that a scratch or what happened there? What you're going to notice is these panels come with one finished edge. That's the front. So that's the front. That's great. And because we're only putting a rod in here, I don't have to worry about buying the one with the holes. I'm not adding shelving into these scenarios. I'm just putting a one shelf down here at this point just for stability and one across the top. So we'll set that aside. And I need another 40 inch piece. This time I'll measure from the right direction. There we go. This time we'll put the plate right on the line. There's number two. Wow, that's almost perfect. All right, um, by the way, almost perfect is still perfect. Next, the, that's the two sides. I'm also making this cabinet 40 inches wide because like I said in the beginning of the video, we're gonna put the tower in the middle, right? And so we'll start with a 40, make the tower, and then we'll make a precise measurement and use the angle of the room and all that jazz for the last piece. But the first two, we're just gonna build right here, right off of my design. Um, so I need another piece at 40. I'm gonna show you another trick here that will help make your life easier. I probably should have done it the first time, but I didn't. Listen, this is not an ideal setup. <laughs> It's just the best that I could come up with on site at the last minute without spending a fortune. My piece is going to be 40. The off cut here is garbage. No good to me, right? So it's an eight foot board. I'm going to cut at 48 first. What that's going to do is it's going to give me the ability to measure left to right both times. And it's going to make my off cut so small that it, I don't risk breaking the board as I'm cutting it through. Okay, so let's just get that set up. Let's cut that one. Give or take here is easier. All right. Now when I measure off my 40, you can see I'm only having a few inches of off cut here. That's good. Okay. Just 
to keep my life organized. Okay, I'm gonna write on here top, all right? And the reason I'm doing that is because now I get to measure exactly for my rail, my French cleat. And look at that, it's exactly 40. I guess that actually works. Very cool. Here's my cleat. Okay. And this is the first cabinet A, marked on my cleat. And the inside dimension of this is exactly 40. All right, so here's how this cabinet's gonna work. We got gables, and this is carrying all of the weight, all right? So when you're building boxes, if you put a shelf across the top like this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna help keep it from going, moving around if there's a piece on the side as well, okay? But if all we have is four pieces, top and bottom, and then the two gables, all right? It's not strong enough. So, now we've got introduced this French cleat, okay? And that's gonna sit on here something like, like this, I guess, eh? Yeah, there we go. And that helps a little bit, but it's not gonna be perfect. So we also wanna cut something that's 40 inches long out of that one by four for the bottom, because when I build this thing, my shelf is gonna be three and a half inches off there, okay? So that the rod can be attached underneath. So, for stability, we'll have the French cleat at the top, we'll have four sides, but to keep this thing from rocking around too much, I'm gonna cut another piece of one by four, exactly the 40 inch, so that we can assemble it. Now, I'm gonna take all of this material into the other room where I've got a table set up and we can actually assemble this thing and get it hung. I've made a couple of errors. We're just gonna run through them really quickly. One of them is, I have two sides, I've got a top, and I've decided I wanna put the top on the top. That's 40, that's my measurement. That's what I'm going with, and my French cleat. I'm gonna run into a design problem. I'm gonna show you how to fix it. Hi, yi yi. let me just cut this and we'll go back to the assembly table and I'll explain it there. It'll make a lot more sense and trying to explain it here where you can't see it all going together, okay? This shelf is gonna go inside the gables on a 40 inch cabinet, so I need to take an inch and a half off. And that's what I'm doing right now. I okay. need to create a notch or a recess in the gables where I'm hanging this, okay? And I'm going to create one and three quarters on both sides. Okay, that's the size of that. So here's the front of the gable. This is the back, obviously. And I need to create a notch for my French cleat to be installed. One and three quarters. In order to do that, I need my jigsaw. And this is what you get when you're traveling for 20 bucks. Trying to keep my costs down after all. Uh, I am close to being on budget on this build. So, Every little bit helps. And here we are. That's why I am working with basic tools today. Now, depending on the store you shop at, um, it's nice, they usually sell this material in six foot lengths. So I'm making a six foot box, which would make life really easy. But uh, unfortunately, where I went, I went to both the hardware stores here in town. And at that point I was done shopping. I don't like to spend all day look, looking for material. I'd rather just cut something <laughs> instead of shopping. But here we are. This is an interesting panel. It comes with the holes pre-drilled for the shelf clips. Be careful, there's two standard hole sizes out there, quarter inch or five millimeter. That, you heard me right, I'm now down here in the United States and they sell five millimeter hole clips. This is drilled out of five millimeters. Don't know why we're using that measurement, but it's just the way she goes. Keep that in mind. You know, you can't just buy what looks like a shelf clip and it works every time. There's two different dimensions in the market. A lot of interesting standards out there. Now, this is my cut line for six feet, okay? I'm gonna start by just ripping off the excess. This is garbage. So we'll get rid of the extra because I don't wanna have that much weight. It'll increase the likelihood that something's gonna break and then I'm out 30 bucks, right? That would really suck. 
Now we can actually cut this thing properly. Get it right on the line. I'm gonna mark the bottom with a B. It's just pencil, I'll wipe off with a wet cloth later. But we wanna make sure that we, when we go to assemble this in the other room that uh, we don't get confused, right? Number one, I have to add our notches because we're gonna continue with the French cleat cut into the back of these things. So let's get that out. Here's the front, this is the back here. All right. We might as well finish doing the whole panel before we move on. It's gonna be attached on top of the gables. And so my French cleat will be exactly the same size. A absolute hair. Just under 24. This is cabinet number B. So here we are, just a hair under 24. Okay, so now we're gonna do the bottom shelf. And this is not gonna go underneath, it'll go in, in between. All right, so we're gonna do a series of shelves now. Because we're doing a shelf system, they all need to be exactly the same size which is gonna be interesting. So, the one on the bottom, we're gonna make it 22 and a half, which is the perfect size of this box. And then all the shelves I cut from here on in are gonna be 22 and 15 sixteenths. All right, so that they sit on the pins easy. And there's always gonna be just a little bit of wiggle room. Cause you don't wanna be sitting there like forcing all that in if you wanna move them around. So, this one is gonna be just a hair bigger than the shelves. Now it's kind of a shame, I should show you this, you're gonna get a kick out of it. I was at the store and they sold these. Pre-done edges, right? Perfect shelves. <laughs> I can't use this, because it's only sold in 12 inch and all the rest of the material was sold in 16 inch. But I wanted to get one of these and show you. Um, if you're lucky enough to find this and you make it out of 12 inch, there's your shelf, done. Just make your box a, a, an eighth of an inch wider when you're, when you're building and you can buy these and just drop them in. That would be a great time saver. All right, Whew, that is noisy, eh? Ah, uh, yes sir, 22 and a half and a hair. Okay, now remember when you're cutting, um, because the blade on the saw goes in this direction, Okay, counterclockwise. It's cutting a clean underneath line. Here's my surface lines. You can see the chip's a little bit easier against white. So that's minor chipping. Now, here's the side, the underside of that same piece. Nice and clean. When you're building, always put the nice clean side up top. I'll be putting this side up, but there's a cheat for this. Because when I'm all finished, I can actually take a little bit of white silicone and do a thin bead in the corner. And no one will ever see the chips. But just keep it in mind, um, when you're working like this, not having that material drop is gonna be really important. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab another two by four, cut another block so I can have it on the other side and put another one over here. So it's all resting in place when I'm cutting. And I think that is going to eliminate that damage. I can measure from this edge. And remember, this one was what? 22 and a half and a hair. We want our shelves to be exactly 22 and a half, maybe even just a little bit under. So I'm just gonna put the pencil just to the left of my 22 and a half. So that way I'm eating up the width of the blade in addition. And that should make it perfect for us. Now, so that saves us from having the damage issue. The question is, yeah, perfect. All right. Now, you would think that I could be able to just take this piece, stick it on here, trace the line and cut it and repeat and repeat. What that ends up doing is it ends up making every piece sequentially larger. Okay, we don't want to do that. We want to take the time to measure these off one at a time. We're just going to mark it shelf. Okay, and we'll keep doing that until we get four more. 
Now here in our design sequence, our first box, remember we've got a one by four underneath over here for that, keep it from swaying action. And we're gonna do the same on this. So what we wanna do is have that one by four in the back of this box here as well. So when you're looking at the wall, it looks like it's all one piece. Tricky, tricky. But this one's already hung, so we already got the measurement. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna cut and measure this, confirm it on site while I'm assembling it, but it should not be an issue. I am 22 and a half. We're gonna confirm that with the other bottom piece. Oh, perfect. Okay, now we're ready to go build the box. Okay guys, here's one of these moments where um, <clears throat> I get to eat a little crow and you get to learn from my mistakes. <laughs> now, I caught myself, I was like, oh, I've got a notch for my, and I'm sure a bunch of you in the comments are already going, that's not gonna work, Jeff, you're a dummy. And you're right, it won't. I'm not accounting for the fact that there's gonna be the bottom part attached to the wall, which makes it three and a half inches. Plus I need a little more mercy so I can start high and then drop it down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust this down to five and a half inches. So I got a two inch mercy. I can finish this cut all the way down. And then what's gonna happen is I'll have the French cleat, which will represent that piece. Okay, and then I'll have another piece of wood that'll cover the gap. All right, and that's the way it's gonna have to be. We'll do it on French cleats, we'll hang everything, then I can still do the floor later, right? I'll leave a gap. You know what, there's situations in life where this is gonna be beneficial. Uh, maybe not ideal in every scenario, and if you need to have a simpler system to follow. I have another video where I did this, uh, a similar kind of closet build for my daughter. And we'll put that video link in the description below. Everything there is sitting on the ground and it makes life a little bit simpler because you can go with the stock shelves and the stock, everything's stock. You don't have to cut it all. All right, it's a much faster assembly. You might be asking me, well, Jeff, if you're just hanging it on the wall, why didn't you just buy the system from Home Depot? Like there's two or three different products out there in each of the major stores, right? And what you're gonna find out is um, the material that they're using is half inch, and this is three quarter. And I don't like working with half inch material because that to me is just cheap and it doesn't gonna last. The other thing is they're about, I'm gonna build a box right now, and every box in those systems runs two to 300 bucks. Every box that I'm building runs about 40 to 50 bucks. So if I'm making four boxes, I'm saving myself almost a thousand bucks. And this build, the, the whole double wide trailer renovation, it's all about the money. We're trying to keep our budget under, you know, the $20,000 mark. So when your focus is a budget, you're gonna make decisions that follow that, right? You're not gonna take the easy way out and buy a pre-made product and just screw it all together and stick it on a wall. Here we go. This is how you save money. Now this overcut here, I'm not worried about it. Um, it will be covered by the two pieces of one by four. And here we go, one down. Just to make my life simple, I'm gonna use a combination of air tools and screws to pre-drill, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna just Hold these pieces together nice and flush. Pop a pin in. Okay. And increase my pressure. I'm not happy with that. I'm gonna get over 120. There, now the head should be sinking as well. This is the front of the cabinet. That's the back of the cabinet. Just wanna make sure we think of this. When you look in the cabinet, you wanna be able to see the slope of the cut wood, okay? This needs to be visible to you physically or it's on backwards. <laughs> All right, and again, we're just gonna tack this together real quick and then we'll throw the screws in. Now what I'm creating here is an L shape by screwing this all together. And what that's gonna do is gonna provide a lot more strength as far as transfer to the gable ends. Okay, so the gables carry a lot of the weight. Okay, pre-drill and screw system is made much simpler once it's all nailed together because you don't have to be changing the bit out every five seconds. And the reason I'm pre-drilling because it's particle board is, um, have you ever tried to drive a screw through particle board? <laughs> the melamine surface is actually really difficult to work with. So it's nice to uh, have that as an option here. And one more thing I should show you right out of the gate. I know this isn't new for some of you, but the screw has got a shaft with threads that rise above and beneath. You wanna find a drill bit that is 
the same size as your shaft, you can see the threads above and beneath it at the same time. That gives you grab. So you're filling the hole that you're drilling with the screw, but the threads are grabbing into the wood. And that is how this works. If you don't drill it out, all you're gonna do is split everything up. Now we're done with that, we switch it out. And we're putting in the bit with the T25 head. That goes with the construction screw that we're using. Now there is a drill bit out there that um, will also bore the top of the hole for you. That's more ideal. But this is real life scenario here. And where I went shopping, guys, didn't have it. So I'm just using a little bit of hip pressure to push that in so I don't strip the threads on the screws. There we go. I don't know about anybody else, but I really prefer brad nails and screws over those uh, little plastic dowels and those um, Allen key sets. If you bought this furniture off the shelf at the store, that's what you're doing. You're spending the entire day putting in Allen keys. Oh, here we go. Instead, you can just build it yourself in about the same amount of time. We just gotta put the top on. And to do that, now that I've got the solid L, this is a pretty solid piece of furniture. The top of this doesn't add any structural strength to the rest of the box, okay? It's just to create a shelf. So, if I attach it now, I'm creating more weight <laughs> for when I go to hang it and move it around. So, instead of attaching it now, I'm actually gonna just leave it alone. Because the first thing we wanna do is get that French cleat on the wall. Let's go through the science of this, right? Remember our design, 40 inch box, six foot tower. So we'll start in the middle with our six foot tower. That's six feet right here, all right? Now, we want it off the ground. So, from here to the top, it's still uh, 72, 18 inches, all right? So if we wanna go a foot from the ceiling, we should go to there, about here. That leaves a nice space above the same gap as all the other shelving. I think that'll be pleasant and it'll give you extra storage. It also gives me eight inches at the floor. So then the question here then is, how do I make a straight line across this wall from that mark? Let's just measure from the ground up. That is a 78 inch line. Don't mind my pencil marks. This is only primer. One of the reasons I'm using a French cleat is because I'm gonna build it, install it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm taking the boxes off so I can paint and finish. And then I can stick them back on when everything's dry. Ha! <laughs> That's gonna be amazing. So, what I got here is 78 inch line. And this is gonna be, I'm gonna make it nice and dark. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hang my laser level off of a screw, which is one of the features that this has. You can put a screw in the wall and then mount it right through, right through the back here. My laser line shoots out right there. And I have never really done this yet. I just need to find out how far, it's two inches off the screw hole. Perfect. Thank you, DeWalt, for making something so awesome. So what I wanna do is I wanna put a screw 80 inches off the subfloor in the door over here. Come check this out. Now over there, I don't have the subfloor down yet. So to get this mark, I'm gonna go up here, 80 inches, and then minus the thickness of my subfloor, which is 5 eighths. So I'll take 5 eighths off here, 79 and 3 eighths. And if I'm anywhere even remotely close to that same spot on that wall, I'm gonna be a happy guy. And let's see what we got here. <laughs> so that represents the top of the cabinet. It's a little bit more than an inch and a quarter. So the first part of the French cleat comes down about an inch and a quarter, and that is here, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna install this line here at that point A. So there's my new measurement. So what I'm gonna do is adjust my laser line to be at 74 and a quarter, minus my 5 eighths, and then I'll be able to install my French cleat. There we go. Measure once, do everything else twice. Okay, that works. Okay? Yeah. All right, guys, so here we go. This is my original goal, okay? And this line right here, this is gonna work. It's four inches instead of three and a half. When you put a French cleat together on an exterior wall, you never get it to mend perfectly. There's always a little more space. 
because it's really hard to jam it all in and contour with the wall. So this is going to be fine. My finish is probably right here. And I'm not worried about that. It's just about getting the ballpark. I'm not trying to be picky about my spot as much as making sure that I have a laser line. Now, we're going to take our uh, stud finder, push the button on the wall, find my studs. X marks the spot, right? And there we go. This is the whole process. We're assuming everything here is built 16 inch on center and, and we have that experience based on the, the work we did in the bathroom. All right, well, that's aggressive, but that's fine. And I always aim for the middle. <laughs> you have more chance of success that way. Okay, and I know that there's a, the drywall seam is, I know there's a stud here and I know there's one there. So what we have is we got two pieces of trim here that's definitely in the way. Oh, all right, now I don't have an oscillating tool. I don't have my fine, I don't have my DeWalt, I don't have anything. So I'm gonna pull the trim off, try not to destroy it. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll cut and reinstall it afterwards so that I can close up the gaps, all right? I actually saved a couple pieces from another part of the demolition because I wanna replace where the, this piece as well. I used to have a bracket there, the old closet. And remember, just as a quick note, as a DIYer, um, make sure when you go buy something like screws, you always buy a box much bigger than what you need, okay? Because generally you can get 10 times the number of screws for twice the dollar. And then you'll never have to shop for that screw size ever again. But uh, I was using inch and a quarter to put the cabinet together, and now I've got a two inch to hang it on the wall. I've got a three quarter inch piece of wood, quarter inch drywall makes one, and I wanted to make sure I got at least three quarters in the wood and uh, this is working out well. The truth is, according to building code, this would be too long because I'm driving too deep in the wall. But I already know there's no electrical in this wall because I know how they built these places. They ran all the power near the floor at one foot off the ground. All of it, the whole, all of it is just all right there. If you don't believe me, check out our bathroom series. That will blow your mind. When we're all said and done, at the end of the day, everything's painted, we can buy little white plastic caps that cover these screws. Okay, we don't have to use filler and paint. Just buy the plastic caps, it makes your life a lot easier. Now each screw carries about 80 pounds of structural load. That is the sheer strength of a screw, all right? So when you're thinking about this, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times eight. Yeah, you do the math. I'm too tired to do the math today and get it right. <laughs> All I know is it's a whole lot more than you need. Now, big surprise, nothing in the corner. And that's why we're using a French cleat because this is not traditional construction. Nobody's framing the back of this. What they do is they build the whole outside. They cover it all. This sheet, this drywall was four feet right on and then they build the interior wall and then they cover that. It's a different kind of construction technology. So you're not gonna find a piece of wood in every corner when you want one, which is why the French cleat is almost a necessity in this situation. When I was shopping for closets, I took a look at the wire rack system, other prefabs, and they were predetermined designs and you had to have somewhere to attach this where their structural point was for their product. You can't use that here. You gotta make it custom. If you don't build it custom, you can't have a nice closet. All you're gonna get is a shelf and a rut. So forget about buying all those other kits. Buy some material, build it yourself, save a ton of money, and then you just drop it on the cleat. And then as I'm saying that, I realize, oh my God, Jeff, you built this wrong. Yeah, that's right. The shelf is supposed to be a couple of inches higher. So I got room to attach the other rod underneath. Ha, ha, ha. That's okay. One of the benefits of the French cleat is when you screw up, and you will, let's build this properly. I really should be looking at my designs more often. All right, here we go. If you don't have this tool and you're gonna use brad nails on anything, get it. If it doesn't work by pulling it through, at least it'll cut the head off. Now what I did do in, by doing this is I made the bottom of this look ugly. So what I got is a piece of one by four clamped together to here to create a, 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 like a stop. So my shelf is something to sit against. And I've clamped that together with the shelf. And now I use this square here, this edge, is lined up on the edge of that shelf. 
So now I know where my shelf is all the way down here. Okay, and this marks it. Now what I want to do is the existing shelf has a hole at this height. So I want to change the screw location. So I know it'll be nice and strong. Okay, same with here. Okay, that's one of the systems you can use. Keep everything lined up so we aren't going to be drilling through the other side of that gable. Three or four times. Anything you do when you make it out of wood can be fixed. All right, piece of cake. And now we duplicate that on the other side. Okay, here we are. Now, obviously because of this we're sticking out, I'm going to get myself an oscillating tool or knife or something and we're going to cut that out before we install it after we paint, but for now we're going to leave it alone. Just want to get that in position. All right, now here's the top shelf just to give you an idea how this is going to look when it's finished. We'll get that in there. And generally what we do when we're building closets is we take the brad nailer and we'll throw one or two pins in the corner just so that it's not sliding around and that's it. If you're wondering about how this ends up being finished, that other one by four that I was talking about goes right here, okay? We obviously are gonna cut it to size and then when we're finished, we'll put a small little thin bead of white silicone after we've got all the primed wood painted. Now we got the basics. We'll build the second box and install that one. And then we're gonna add the rails for this as well. So the next box we're going to build is 24 inch, which means we have access to this stud and this stud. So one of the things we want to do, because it's such a big piece and we don't want to be hanging it just off of the French cleat and that's carrying all the weight. So we're going to have the piece of one by three down here across the middle, right? That's the goal. So what we want to do is hang that one by three, the height of a finished cabinet. Well, we'll measure from here at 40 inches and up. So I'm gonna measure from the top down to 40 inches and that'll be the bottom of the back brace. So that if you are across the room and you look, you're gonna see a back brace on this piece, on this piece, and this piece, all at the same place. And those back braces are gonna provide a little extra stability and another surface there to screw to to help carry the weight. Now, the beautiful thing about this particular board is it's drilled in holes all the way through. So that hole, it's in the same size, same space as the other side. All right, there's my 40 right there. Now I can actually tack that right now. Just make sure your face is nice and leave the gaps for the back. Whew, now we can pre-drill and put some screws in this bad boy. You know what's amazing? Is I'm gonna build the entire closet in less than a day and I'm gonna save a thousand bucks, which means if I renovate my house 200, 200 times a year, 200 days a year, or let's say the average person does it 52 days a year, one day a week, you're gonna make, on materials alone, you're gonna save $1,000. Be in handy. And then take a look at all the time and money you're gonna save. Well, forget about the time. You're, gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna have wasted time, but you're gonna save a fortune on labor cost, just one day a week, guys. One day a week is all it takes, and you can make an extra six figures a year as a homeowner working on your own house, developing your own return investment, increasing the value of your property, increase the quality of your own life while you're living there. Everybody who owned a house in America worked one day a week on their own property you'd all make an extra $100,000 a year. Now, I'm gonna put the top of this one on right away. Just because, <laughs> I think it makes good sense to have that extra stability right out of the gate on this one. She's coming together. Let's just recap, I've gotta cut the strap. 
no big deal. I have to actually cut a bunch of shelves. I've got pins to put in that for the shelving. That'll work great. And now I got to put rods in. Where are the rods? Ooh, up front. All right, when you're installing a closet rod, pay attention to your hanger options. If you go too tall, you can't get the hanger up and over, right? This hanger makes it really easy for, for close calls. Like, look at that. What do I need, like an inch from the top? That's awesome, okay? But if you're using old traditional hangers with a bigger hook, you won't be able to get them on, all right? So consider new hangers with new rods. And the reason we're using tape is because it is a measuring system. Check this out. Right up against the edge up here. Okay, hold on. Sets my depth. It's that simple. Now you're gonna to wanna to consider your rod with your clothes. You don't want them sticking out too far? You can slide it in. Okay. All right, somewhere comfortable. I like to go back a couple of inches and this will work really nicely here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna line up my edge right there. That's my hole, okay? That'll work amazing. That might be even the same thickness. That's even a better idea. We're gonna just use the level as our measuring template. That is awesome. Always look for ways to make things easier. There's my mark, okay? So now I can go over here and line it up on the front and the, it's the same spot. For my lead screw, let me just mark and draw. Okay. That seems simple enough, eh? The big screws if I'm going into drywall. Six, perfect. These are actually to set the rod so that it doesn't slide out. Because this is an adjustable rod, but there's no way to keep it from shrinking and falling out of the hole. Here, check this out. It comes in two pieces. Okay. One fits in the other. And there's another hole there. Okay, so. Oh, it'd be nice if that sticker was maybe on the small one. <laughs> Buggers. But you see the hole here? That hole is gonna line up with this hardware hole, okay? And so that you can actually throw a screw in it so that when you've got lots of weight on here and you grab something, you don't accidentally pull the rod out of the fastener because it slides, okay? Yeah, so make sure you use the set screws. But then they gave me these three tiny little screws here, which is great, except there's two rods to hang. One on each end. There's two, two brackets, so I need six screws. I don't know what they're thinking. Now I get to go back to Lowe's where I bought this. And you know what, honestly, it was a, it's a cute little system. It gave me lots of flexibility when I got here. Um, just a little bit disappointed is all. Well. Now I don't have enough screws, I've gotta go buy more. I need to pre-drill the hole. Because it is melamine, right? We know this. And I'm gonna need something really tiny. Because those are some really tiny screws. I'm gonna go 1 16th. It's almost not pre-drilling at all, except I get past that melamine. And the melamine is really the problem here, because that screw is not gonna go into that. Remember, because I'm taking this back down, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to use a long screw that goes in the next cabinet or into the wall. No measuring needed. Next goes 36 to 60 inches. Carries 40 pounds at 60 inches. That means it'll carry a lot more than 40 pounds in this environment because it's a lot stronger when it's uh, not stretched out as far. That also means in theory that the rod should bend before it's carrying so much weight that it would fall off the wall because the screws carry more weight than the rod. And so that should help make some of you feel better. We gotta line this hole up. The hole just kind of helps get this started, but still a self-tapping screw I'm using here. There we go. So the cabinet in the corner where the light is, <laughs> we can measure across front and back, okay, to get our absolute measurement. I gotta peel the trims. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this off the wall to install the other cabinet and then install this one again when it's time, all right? So there's no sense going through how we built that. We're just gonna build another one of these over there. Let's deal with this one now. Uh, building a shoe rack. Here we go guys, shelf clips, package of 48. Careful when you're shopping. Different stores sell them in different packages. Some of them are just four or eight clips for the same price as 48. 
Yeah, okay. I did a little bit of comparison shopping with the two big box stores. Wildly surprised how much they're trying to rip you off. A good one is round, goes in the hole, and then it's flat to hold the shelf. Okay, and the idea is, yeah, they go in. They're just right for the hole. You want them to go all the way in. Once they're in, if they're not flat, you can just take a pair of pliers and you can straighten that out. And of course, we're cutting our shelves just a little bit shorter than it needs to be. Boom, perfect, right? But here's the thing. When you're making the same box for this side, for your shoes, take your clips from the front and drop them down two more holes. What that does, it creates a presentation box. You can even go to three or four holes if you want to have a really aggressive slope. And then all you do with the back of this, here's the trick. Ready? Grab yourself a piece of this cove molding. Okay, it's PVC. And you set it on your shelf. And you can screw it in, glue it in, throw in a couple of nails, whatever you want. And now you've got somewhere for your high heels to hook on and so you can have them sitting up on the display in your, in, your, in your cabinet. That is just a great little trick. And then you take another piece of this on the back side so it grabs where the pins are and then the shelf doesn't slide off. That's pretty simple, great little trick there. Oh, finally, <laughs> we're ready to finish off with our closet. We got our floor installed. Let's move on because we're gonna deal with our, our trims now. I'm just taking myself a little cheater piece of baseboard and my oscillating tool and I'm gonna cut all of my trims. And that's it. It's that simple. All right. There we go. <laughs> Come on, baby. <laughs> it's so simple until it's not simple. I'm just going to work my way around the room. We're going to work our way out of the closet. I'm going to install my baseboard as I go, hang my cabinets, do my shelving, put my corner trim in. You're going to see this is a relatively quick process. The little gap that I'm cutting is actually going to get filled up with caulking anyway. So, no one's ever going to see that line. Love a good versatile tool. So now that the trims are cut out, we can cut the baseboards to fill the whole space. I buy them in 16 foot lengths because I have a truck with a little cheater window, so I can slide it right through the front dash. That's a great gig, right? So I don't have to have small pieces on long walls. That's 104 and 5 eighths. I'm going to cut that one first, then we'll hang the cabinet, finish off the cabinet installations. Finally going to start looking like a closet. <laughs> Now we can get this cabinet installed. That's the benefit of the French cleat. You don't have to work with all that in your way. Whenever you're doing cabinetry, have your clamps handy. Lock these things in. We're going to add some screws to finish that off. Now we're not putting it in the holes. We're going to go put an inch behind the hole and drive it flush. That gives us a much better finish. More useless packaging, eh? 8,000 miles of packaging. And three quarters. We were hanging this one and three quarters, and from the wall, 12 and a quarter. That's right. All right, now 12 and a quarter, one and three quarters to the top, 12 and three quarters, 12 and a quarter, sorry. One and three quarters. We're gonna pre drill our holes because melamine does not do well. The screws that don't have holes drilled for them. Now we might need to do a little explaining here because our original thought we were going to have another cabinet here, maybe one at the other end. And then my wife got involved. <laughs> so then the plan changed. Now we're just going with well, one rod here. We're going to save these shelves. This is great for storing your luggage. And you know, at the end of the day, she was right. She's a lot more practical. I was going to overburden this space with too many things. <laughs> I installed it three quarters of an inch too low over here. Three quarters up from here to make that rod level. Next thing I gotta do is I gotta cut a bunch of shelves. I have to cut a shelf to go across here and finish trimming this out and then hang the doors. Well, let's just scoot across to the hanging of the door section. That'll be a little more interesting. There's a few things we can learn here about um, structure and carrying this load and framing it out. Okay, guys, now remember this, this house was built 84. And it had the two mirror hanging doors here for the, since then. And it, this is all basically framed on one by threes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to beef it up. And I'm going to double them up. When I hang my door, I have something to throw some screws into. 
And this might almost be offensive, but the reality is I'm doubling up the structure <laughs> to carry the same load. I know, I know. I'm having a hard time with the tube. How many times in life do we overbuild, overcomplicate? All right. Woo. Let's go put on a header. 71. Sounds good to me. Here we are. We're going to mark our center of our sticks. Okay. And generally, I'm going to try to mark the, the middle of the new wood. I'm going to install this with some brad nails right out of the gate. And then I'm going to go throw a couple construction screws in after the fact, right? This is just to carry the weight. 82 and three quarters, only different. That one's just a hair taller. No big surprise, eh? Okay, so here I'm just going to share this with you. You ever have one of those days that don't go as planned? Um, this is a pre-cut casing. It's a door pack from Home Depot for casing doors. This door is too tall for this casing. It needs to be an extra inch and a quarter longer. <laughs> so I got to go back to the store and buy some more casing. Um, the plan was these are all pre-painted so that I could just install them and then I wouldn't have to use a brush down near the bottom and avoid touching the floor. I thought I was so smart and then I never bothered to measure and that's what happens. So back to the old proverbial drawing board on that one. We'll hit that one tomorrow. Uh, but for today, I wanted to show you one secret because down here uh, the floor was cut a little bit too wide. I'm not an idiot. I know how to cut a floor. So I did this on purpose. I want to show you a really great trick to close this up. So let me cut my length of my baseboard. I'm going to show you what to do when you make this mistake because as a homeowner most likely you will make a mistake something like this. All right, 47 and a half. Let me cut the trim. So here's my issue. When you cut your baseboard too perfect, you nail it on, you get a gap showing up. Okay? That can be because you went and you bought the economy trim from Home Depot to save money. And that's not three quarters, it's five eighths. All right. So when you go to stick it in, you're like, okay, that's going to be great. But then you put a nail in it and it shows this ugly gap. Well, the way we deal with that is this. <laughs> Grab yourself a screw gun. Okay. And bury a drywall screw in the wall. The same depth as what you're gap is showing. And nail it that way. Nail it across the top. A couple of different angles. Come on, baby. And there you go. You're going to get a nice straight clean line. We do the caulking across the top, fill a few nail holes, and you too can hide a plethora of mistakes just by beefing up the back side of the trim, giving it something rigid, right? It hits that nail, it's not going anywhere. All right, well, I'm back from Home Depot. I had to go buy some longer trim. Bought myself a 17-foot piece of trim and cut it in half. So that makes this possible, all right? Now, when you're doing this, the easiest way is to line up, give yourself what looks like a quarter inch, okay, gap. And then you consider, well, then I'm gonna have a quarter inch gap up here, right? So you take your pencil, you set it where it's going to be, and you mark straight out. And then you end up with something like this. And where the pencil starts, that's your mark. That's where you want to start your cut, and you want to do it on a 45. Okay? So that's how we mark it. We do the left and the right side. And then we'll cut these two and install them. I'm going to show you how to use the saw my way, which is you measure once, and then you cut twice. So we'll start with this one here. The way this works for best results is to have the mark right in front of your face. All right? So that way you can see what is going on. Okay. Now, I'm working on a bench. I do not have a miter saw station set up. So that it is a little trickier working on a portable scenario like this. All 
Okay, so now I got my material set up. Here's my trick. I line up relatively close and I take my tape measure way down here. Okay, and that holds my material flat. It's only an eighth of an inch taller than the table, so it, it saves me a lot of hassle. Now here's what we're gonna do. Instead of holding the off cut, I'm gonna hold this piece, okay? With my thumb against this, so I can't get in the way. What we're looking at here is I've got my pencil mark, right, on my trim. And I wanna cut and leave that pencil mark still visible. So I wanna cut on the, this side of that trim. So what I do is I'm using my line of sight down this blade to anticipate where it's gonna cut. All right, so that way when I do cut, I can hold the guard out of the way. I make a little bit of a mark, okay? And then I can adjust my trim by sliding it with my finger to the perfect spot. Now when I look, I can still see my pencil mark, okay, which is a perfect cut. Like I said, I measured once and then I cut twice. That's how you zero in on that to make it perfect. And in like manner going the other direction. Change that degree. Bring my, remove the guard, bring it down, eyeball it. That looks really tight. Then I start the motor, little check. And from my cut, I still see my pencil mark. There we go. Nice. So I know that there's framing right here. Okay? So instead of trying to use nail into this trim right away, I'm just going to go for my positioning. Okay? In this trim right here, throw a couple of nails in. That gives me wiggle room when I'm installing the rest of my trim later. Okay? Same on the other side. I'll get it, my mark established. Knowing that this comes warped, in a lot of cases it's not straight, so you're gonna have to straighten it out as you go. But right now what I'm doing is I'm establishing the header. So here's how we measure that one. We measure from the outside to the outside. This one is 74 and a half. So now I cut the header 74 and a half, put the angle cuts on both ends, and I can set it in place. And even if I'm a little shy or a little, little long, I can manipulate the trim to make sure I get a perfectly square corner. So now I've got that detail in place. I'm switching over to the shorter one and a quarter inch nails. And I'm going to shoot this detail into the jam. Make sure that we get this straightened out. Right here, it needs to be pulled back a bit. And then I switch back to the two inch just to pull the trim nice and tight to the wall. Okay. The whole point when you're doing your trim work is to eliminate gaps. Get rid of all the shadows that you can, okay? And then it'll reduce the amount of caulking that you gotta do and make your life a lot easier. <laughs> all right. Let me just, uh, Take a look at this now. Okay, today I am using the DAP crown molding trim caulking. Um, it's a, uh, they claim to be crack proof. That's nice, I got, I got, cause I got a couple issues here. I'm gonna install the header for my doors and install my doors now and paint after. But I do have this detail here that needed a little bit of a fill. And I wanna do this before I Start putting other materials in the way. There we go. We are going to set this edge a quarter inch back from the face. There we go. I like that location. Alrighty. Let me just get my first 
screw in place here. These screws are horrible. <laughs> okay, Woof. for the record, these construction screws you guys got down here in the US, they sell them at Home Depot, they got a horrible initial bite. Does everybody else have the same issue or is it just me? Oh my goodness. Totally out of whack. Whenever I see a hole in the track that's going to be carrying weight, I like to throw a screw in it. And anticipating I was going to need five or six, the jam piece as well, I put a screw in every single piece of new wood that we had up there. So we are going to be talking the capacity to carry 80 times six, that's almost 500 pounds. Now these doors, although their mirrors are heavy, they're not 500 pounds. So as long as we can have a nice healthy transition so the gap from the carrying screws are short, then this extrusion, this metal molding, will be able to carry all kinds of weight for us. Now generally speaking with these wheels, if you leave a little bit more height from the bottom to the top of the, the door, it's easier for installation purposes. All I do is I sit back here like this, and I walk up and I put it on and then slowly to the ground and make sure that it's hanging and not scraping the ground. Wow, that is just clearing. Okay, that is really close for comfort. So before I go any further, we're going to shorten up the gap. The drill just driving forward and it lifts the door. I have the same problem, so this is good. All right, now, nothing in this world is level and square, but you do want to have your door have a position that's going to be permanent. So over here, I want to make sure that this door is flush with the jam, and a couple of little twists, and there we go. That's about as good as we're going to get. Okay. Not bad for a couple of reclaimed doors, eh? There we go. I get up. Get it up on that trim here. Oh. There, that's the harder of the two. And I'm gonna go lift those wheels as well. And I'll slide the door. Oh. That's not in the track yet. There we go. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Whew. Again, we're just gonna square this off. Okay, now the only thing left for me to do, of course, is to put in the bottom track. And they don't carry that at my local Home Depot, so tomorrow I gotta go for a nice long drive, but a two hour return trip to get to the closest store that carries this product.